talk about light, our need for light, not only when the sun is up, but also when it's dark around us, we want to be able to produce the light we need. So I'm going to talk about the ideal lamp, the one that got us used to see things. And it took millions of years for us to develop the ideal detector system. So our lights are very satisfied by the daylight, but of course we need to be able to use similar resources at, at night time. So this curve shows the so-called black body radiation, which is the distribution of photons coming out of a black body, like the sun. And the sun is, tip is around 5,500 degrees C. It's very, very hot. And it is on an appropriate distance. We get warm, but not, but not boiling. So uh, for the temperature of 5,500, you have a peak right in the visible. The eyes train for green, as there's a song saying, another song. So the sun provides us with abundant visible light. With the, visible, with the distribution uh, governed by the temperature. So, um, when the sun is gone, we still need light around us, something that would satisfy our eyes. So the question is, how can such light sources be made to us, making us independent and not limited to just do things in full daylight? Um, we have a different a couple of ways of doing this. One is to, in principle, copy what the sun is doing, namely to create a hot body, this black body system. Uh, we cannot bring it to 5,500 degrees C, but we can typically, in a light bulb incandescent lamp, get to 2,500 degrees C, and then we are with this spectral distribution, which means that it's just a tiny little tail that you see down to the left that is in the visible range. Typically, maybe 4% or so of the photons are really visible to us. So it's not really the ideal thing. Uh, we have another alternative, which is exactly what we're working for now, namely to create LEDs or mo mono uh, uh, single color light sources in principle to optimally mix a blue photon source, a green, and a red. Uh, if we do that, and if we can do that with LEDs of extremely high efficiency, then we can create a white light source that uh, the brain cannot really, that, that, that takes care of this information, cannot really distinguish from a broadband white light source. So I decided to put in a couple of slides that are very basic on the physics leading to photons, emission of light. And uh, the principle is that the sun and the light bulb emit photons because they get very hot. So you can think of this as a two-level, two-energy level system in which the hot temperature excites electrons from the ground state to the excited state. And then when the electron falls down again or the electronic system, relaxes down to the ground state, it sends out a photon with the energy and wavelength corresponding to that energy difference. Now that was the limitation of just heating things. The question is, could we make a light source that is a cold light source, that is not based on it being hot? And what I'm going to describe to you in the next slide, in continuation of this slide, is that we can build an LED in which we can electrically populate uh, the system. So ex ex exactly the same way as this excitation was done by heat, we can do, now do that by resonant excitation of electrons into the up uh, upper state and an empty an, a, a hole into the ground state. And once we've done that, then the system can relax and out comes the photon in exactly the same way. But in this case, the light source is cold, cold as a room temperature where it's, it is being used. So how this is done, now, this is a little bit similar to physics that not all of you are very com comfortable with, so I do it very simple. Uh, in principle, what we do is we create a device in which we can produce electrons. Those are the filled yellow circles. So with the left side of this device is filled with n-type conductivity, which is electron with electrons. And the right-hand side is what we've heard before, p-doping, which means that you ho have holes. And these electrons and holes, they are not in the same place in space, so they don't really see each other, and there is nothing much happening. Unless we attach a battery, 
which means that we are lifting the electrons on the left side, we are moving them to the right, and the holes on the right side is moved to the left, and then they are seeing each other in the very similar configuration as you had here. Now you have electrons and holes in a two-level system, and they're just driven by the electrical power from the battery. And indeed, we can today do that with the high efficiency and produce blue, green, yellow, and red LEDs, and that's really what this is all about. So, uh, there's been a lot of development in this field. Uh, Pion junctions are now, is now a pretty mature technology, especially for making blue LEDs. It is so mature that it even made us in the physics class of the Royal Academy to send out the message last Tuesday that the Nobel Prize in Physics this year goes to the people that developed what became the blue LED. So first, a little bit of a historical. I have a little part here about the, the Nobel Prize. Of course, LEDs have been around actually way back since the early 1900s, but really when this technology development came from 1960s and onwards, initially you had red-emitting LEDs only, uh, gallium phosphide, so-called indirect gap semiconductor, uh, gallium arsenide phosphide, efficiency of 0.1% or so efficiency, good enough for indicator lamps, you know, we've seen a lot of that. And then as time went on, we came to the D8, stands for double heterostructure LEDs. That was what gave Sora Zalfirov and Herbert Kromer the Nobel Prize in 2000 for the, the, the heterostructure concepts. And then as time went on, the gallium aluminum indium phosphide material has now been the material of choice for the red LEDs. They are now very efficient. And what happened from mid-90s and up here, when the, continuation, the improvement is still very strong, is primarily light management. The way you can actually design the efficient outcoupling of light uh, into, out of the semiconductor. Uh, the blue LEDs were very lousy until pretty late, and the breakthrough came, of course, with the indium gallium nitride, the work by uh, Akasaki and Amano, and later with Nakamura, that brought this very quickly up to the 10% range, and then up now, actually, 50% 50, 50 or so efficient wall plug efficiency. Um, on the green, it's much more complicated. The indium gallium nitride LEDs are now a little bit more than 10% in efficiency, and that's one area where we really have to do something. The white circles here are the, the phosphorus converted white LEDs, which means that you have this efficient blue pumping a broad spectrum of phosphor that creates the broad spectrum that appears white but has its limitations. So, just to remind you, these are the three laureates that will come to Stockholm in the beginning of December, and we will celebrate them for the invention of the efficient blue light emitting diodes, which has enabled bright and energy saving white light sources. So, um, here's another picture that came out, it was in Sydsvenskan on Wednesday, the local paper, I think it's quite interesting, because it makes a comparison of the efficiency or the efficiency of the light output from an in incandescent lamp, standard lamp, 40-watt lamp, and its counterparts in the, in the uh, light tube uh, uh, technology and the LED lamp. You see you go from 17 lumens per watt, which is a measure of the, of the efficiency, up to today you can actually purchase even up to 300 lumens per watt which is a factor of almost a factor of 20 more photons for the electrical power that you put in. You have other big advantages, of course, that uh, a bulb, as most of you know, climbing upstairs to the roof, uh, your ceiling, is, is uh, 1,000 hours or so, while uh, so is 10,000, and the LEDs are now going way beyond 50,000, probably towards 100,000 in the re reasonable lifetime. There was a saying that uh, these lamps, uh, they have to be replaced, but maybe your grandchildren will do it. So, this is all very good, isn't it? Uh, so, isn't, is it possibly good enough? Uh, do we really need new nanotechnology to improve things? Well, there is a need to uh, replace the today's technology for white LEDs with uh, the three LEDs that I've introduced you to before, namely the blue, the green, and the red. The blue LED is really very good, as I said, more than 50% wall plug efficiency. 
Uh, this is by the, the sensitivity of the eye, by the way. I won't have time to talk more about that. But when we go out towards the, the green, you see the power drops uh, significantly. It's down in the 10, 15%, most of the things that you can actually get on the market. Uh, the yellow is even worse if, you, if you're doing that uh, either from the nitride system here or from the aluminum aluminum phosphide that I also mentioned. This is really a problematic area. Then when you go out into the saturated red, it's pretty good again if you're using the aluminum aluminum phosphide. Ideally, we'd like to do everything with nitrites. So this green valley, which is the problem, is where we're trying to go much above what you can do with today's technology and with the phosphor-converted white LEDs to bring it up to the 30 to 50 to 60 percent efficiency. Incidentally, I can say that the work we're doing together with GLOW is now climbing up from, from this type of level to at least 30-35% or maybe even more than that in the green. So what we're doing is to do nanowire LEDs. Uh, here you see an array of nanowires. So we we, we, we uh, grow them in small openings on substrates. I don't have time to talk more about that, but they are highly ideal, virtually dislocation-free. This geometry also allows much more indium to be incorporated. That's why we can go out into the saturated green much more easily than you can with the planar technology. And also you can do choose crystalline orientations where you don't have the complications of so-called built-in piezoelectric fields that tends to uh, reduce the efficiency of, of the LED recombination and reduces the freedom in the design. So uh, this is now what we're doing. We're developing these perfect nanowire arrays done by pattern by non-imprint lithography, as we heard Magnus Boyston talk about. And we're doing that a European project uh, with a number of European partners, and where Glow AB is the industrial partner. And here's an example of a commercial LED made by them. So we're doing now the, the blue, green, yellow, and the red, that's the, the target for this European project. And the reason for doing that is that we can get up to extremely high uh, color rendering index, which is t t talks about how perfectly can we reproduce the colors of an object that is being illuminated. And for many aspects, many applications, this is absolutely necessary. And then you need at least to get up to three or four colors. I say we also do nano. Here's an, an extreme example. Right now we're working together with the people in, in, in the medical faculty, Marav Kokaya, who's a research leader in opto, uh, optogenetics, Jens Schoenboy in the neurosciences part of this as well, where we go to the very extreme of actually using a single nanowire LED as a light source to very locally uh, stimulate the optogenetic signals and actually do nerve-to-nerve, cell-to-cell signaling uh, investigations. So, the market today, liquid crystal displays, tomorrow it's going to be general illumination. When tomorrow is, if that might be three years from now, it might be three, five years from now, but there is not much doubt that that is coming. So what I spoke to you about was to make uh, uh, the highly efficient and cold light sources. Uh, Magnus Boyström talked about you can actually do solar cells, and by combinations of these we think we can do things to help the world develop in a good direction. So here is, I showed this primarily to say that this is more or less the same technology. The same PN junctions, in one case injecting electrons and holes and making them recombine if very efficiently, close to 100% efficiency. And the other example, when you excite electron hole pairs and they are separated very quickly by the built-in electric fields, giving the highly efficient solar cells. So with this, the outlook for the future we think that non in, we have a, a challenge in front of us to do, develop nanoscience for the benefit of the developing world. Uh, the distributed energy supply via solar cells, this is Magnus Boystrom's talk more or less. The low voltage lighting that will be perfectly compatible with the low voltage system of the solar cells. Uh, we also develop UV LEDs for water purification to also to supply the world with efficient uh, water, uh, water purification. And of course, uh, all the nanotechnology for the lab on chip that Jonas Tegenfeld spoke about. So, with that, brings me to the end. Let there be light, let there be light emitting diodes from macro to nano. So, the people that made us, allowed us to do this for the basic research, it's what you see down here, and for the industrial development up here. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We should have some uh, joint singing, perhaps, because yes. this is really great. We do that at great. dinner. <laughs>
who dares to ask now something I'm sure you more? Do. Or no. <laughs> <laughs> You made a little comment there to M-plane nanowires. Yes. But I think you all showed C-axis growth. I only... Sh well, um, we grow the wires in the C orientation, but then we switch growth mode and do the entire device in the radial M-plane orientation. Aha. Uh -huh. So okay. the pin junctions are radial, okay. and the quantum wells are the, in the radial direction. Okay. But otherwise, it's, you know... There. I don't know which one. The green. Uh, <laughs> Oof. <laughs> you have to r run down, yeah. <laughs> like that. So. Uh, like you mentioned that uh, in the night we do not have light. Uh, the same thing goes for the solar cell generation that uh, since we do not have light in the night time, and uh, since I'm an engineer, what I realized was when you're working with solar cell systems, uh, the major drawback of the system is you need a storage system, and that is where the, the major cost goes in. Mm. So uh, do you think that it is possible that we can develop some solar cells that work in the night, probably utilizing the, the thermal generation, like using the, the, the infrared rays, not in the, in the optical region, for maybe the countries which have uh, uh, a very high temperature at night or something like that? Mm. Well, maybe you could use uh, thermal, uh, the blackboard radiation from the uh, surrounding, but there is another alternative at nighttime that people are looking at. That is actually to use the, the I'm, I don't know if I'm not an astrophysicist, but the, 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 the illumination, I think, around 1.5 to 2 microns, around 2 microns, I think it is, a back, background radiation that is throughout the night. Uh, th I think that is enough to actually uh, uh, illuminate for cameras that have this sensitivity. Uh, if it is meaningful to use it for harvesting energy, I'm not sure. But it's an interesting issue. Over there. <laughs> you have a running yes. session here. That's good. <laughs> In terms of sustainability, Will there be enough indium? <laughs> well, uh, I think as long as you re limit the indium content to, say, three quantum wells in the radial direction, I think it's not going to be an issue. And the gallium in the gallium nitride is abundant. So as long as you don't need to do the whole material in indium, like you have an indium tin oxide, then I think this is not an, not an issue for us. I think we thank you very much, Lars. Thank you for everything on this.